everybody. We got a great one today. And this time, this time, I finally mean it. We've got Tim Alberta, staff writer for the Atlantic Monthly. And we talk about his new New York Times bestseller, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, American Evangelicalism in an Age of Extremism. A great book, but an even better podcast. Now, I, I did not know much about evangelicals. Uh, before I got this book, and it knocked my socks off. But the podcast, Tim is an evangelical himself. His dad was a Presbyterian minister and an evangelical church in the suburbs of Detroit. And to be frank, I, I did not know what an evangelical was. I, I thought it was something about having a personal relationship with Jesus, which it is. But I, I wanted to bring Peter uh, in here, you know, Peter, my executive producer and engineer. Uh, basically, it's just Peter and me who would do this podcast, right, Peter? That's it. So, first of all, how great is uh, Tim Alberta? So good. I've been really looking forward to this interview uh, for a long time, and he really delivered. Okay. Now, you uh, grew up in uh, South Carolina. Yeah. And your family went to an evangelical church, Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. Yeah. That's his and Southern Baptists were created in like eighteen forties or eighteen fifties, I think. Don't Google or look up why the Southern Baptist Church was founded. <laughs> okay, and if you if you Google that, you'll find out that they were just kind of in support of, of slavery, right? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, you uh, now you have nothing to be embarrassed about. You you um you left the church, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I left the church when I was about 14 years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've told me this. This was uh you, there was a sermon given by your minister, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So in in 1993, some people might remember this story, there was uh, a doctor by the name of David Gunn. Uh, he was in Florida mm -hmm. and he provided abortions. He was an abortion doctor and someone shot him and killed him. Uh, and that was, that was in March of 1993. And it was a big story at the time. It made kind of national news. And there was a sermon at my church and the pastor stood up and said, uh, I know a lot of people are talking about this doctor, the abortion doctor that was killed, and I'm sure his family is very sad, but we have to think about and we have to remember the number of lives that were saved by him being killed. Okay. <laughs> so 14-year-old you. I told my parents, I said, I won't go here anymore. I'm not going to this church. I'm not going to be a part of this church. And they were very upset with me. <laughs> they were very upset with me. Yeah. And they, they thought about it for a while. And finally, we, they had their talk with me. And they said, as long as you live in this house, you will go to a church. And you don't have to go well, to this church, but you have to go to a church. That sounds like your parents were wise. It was a good compromise. No. It was a good compromise, <laughs> I guess. I mean, it they, was, wasn't it? You know, yeah. I mean, because you did that, didn't you? I did. I did, went to a went Methodist to church. I went to a Methodist church, which also made them very upset because <laughs> I don't know. They thought the Methodists were a little too loose with their rules. You know, like I went to one youth group function and there was a dance, a co-ed dance uh, for the teenage Ooh. boys and girls, and they it's that. I, I, the, the concept of seeing that happen in real time as like a 15 year old kid growing up in a Southern Baptist church I, blew my mind. I, I couldn't believe that I was watching girls dance with boys at a church function. <laughs> it's crazy. Boy, it's very different from my uh, reformed Jewish upbringing in Minneapolis. I can imagine. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it all worked out. It all worked out. I know you're a great son, and uh, so they did. They came up with a good compromise. That was the compromise, and you know they stayed with the church. They they stayed going to that church, which which was a little bit of a create a little bit of a rift in our relationship as I as I got older. But 
Now, now let me ask you, so, because uh, I had always thought that, and I think I say this to Tim in, in our interview, that I had always thought being evangelical was about baptism. Right, right. And and not, not baptism as a baby, which the Catholics do, but baptism where you go out and you get your head dunked, right? <laughs> yeah, I got my head dunked. I was, I was young. I was probably eight, maybe nine, something like that. So, you know, you have to factor in a lot of the external forces pushing you in that direction right but but basically uh what that is is you're turning your you're basically turning your life to jesus which is what being an evangelical is right yeah i think tim hit on this in the interview and and yes you and i talked about this and we before. should get to that right away <laughs> we'll get to it we'll get to it you and yeah, i yeah. talked but, but before we interviewed tim and you asked me about the definition of an evangelical i couldn't quite give you one but i think he hits on it when he says kind of you remove the middleman and you have a personal relationship with god and jesus and you speak when you pray, you pray directly to God. And to, to do that, you have to sort of accept whatever God is telling you. You make a public pronouncement that you have asked God to come into your life, and you turn your life over to Him. And when you pray, you pray directly to Him. And sort of what's very interesting about this book is it's about uh, evangelicalism in the age of extremism. And there's this a story he talks, he opens with his dad was an evangelical minister in a church in Detroit in the suburbs. And uh, his father dies and he comes back and he has written a book called American Carnage about Trump. And it's just been out and he's been on TV about it. <laughs> and yeah. he comes back in the room with his dad's casket, you know, for the wake uh, he, these parishioners come and start yelling at him. Ay, ay, ay. And that's uh, part of this uh, interview. So it's a, I, I really love this one. I, th this one is fantastic. And I know that a lot of our listeners are probably outside of the evangelical bubble. And if you are, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling our listeners all sinners. I'm just saying they probably don't. They probably I know don't. you aren't. But it, th this is a really informative, really smart look at how politics involves a lot of religion. And uh, gosh, I'm just so excited we're finally getting this out there because I loved it. Okay, so let's go to this one. Uh, Tim Alberta, staff writer for the Atlantic Monthly. It's a great one, you know, for a change. Have a confession. I'm Jewish. Is that okay? <laughs> a, con a confession is a good way to start the podcast. Uh, yes, that, uh, yes, that is okay. I think, I think, I think I knew that anyway. But yes, that is okay. Do you have confession in evangelical churches? Because I can think of that as Catholic. That is a that is a Catholic ritual. Uh, uh, Protestants we have a direct line to God, so we do not need the middleman of the priest to serve uh, in the confession capacity. And is that because you have a personal relationship with God? Yeah, the the idea is um, in in the sort of obviously borrowing from Martin Luther and other Protestant reformers here, but the idea is that yes, that that Jesus was in fact fully God and fully man, and that the entire idea of messianic salvation was that Jesus served as a mediator between a broken humanity and a perfect God, and that once we have accepted Jesus and invited him into our lives and that we have a relationship uh, and faith in him that that we no longer need a mediator between us and God so that we are able to communicate with God directly because of our relationship with Jesus. And is there an act that does that? Is is a baptism the the, the act? If if you get baptized, does that solidify your your path to God? No, okay. not necessarily. I don't want to diminish the importance of baptism. Um, I, I think really baptism is best understood as sort of an outward demonstration of an inward transformation that has already taken place. Okay. Um, 
you know, I'm looking right now in my home office at a painting called The Light of the World, which I write about at the end of my book. It's hung in my house as a child uh, from the time I was very young. And it depicts Jesus standing in sort of a, a dark uh, wooded uh, scene, standing outside of a door that is kind of overgrown with s- some weeds and thorns, and he's just knocking. The idea is that there is no, as you can, if you if you were looking at the painting, you would see that there is no handle on the outside of the door, that mm-hmm. it can only be opened from the inside. Wow. And so the idea is that Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts and that once we invite him in, then because he is dwelling within us uh, and we have sort of made ourselves uh, subservient to to his will for our lives and that we have kind of removed ourselves from the throne, if you will, and allowed him to be the king of our lives, that that inward transformation will then manifest itself in, in all other ways in our lives and that people will recognize that transformation, whether we've been baptized, whether we say fancy prayers out loud for people to hear, whether we wear big garish cross necklaces. <laughs> I mean, that, that stuff is really, that, that, those outward things are, are less important than the inward transformation. And so let's be clear here. You are an evangelical. Well, I struggle with the term evangelical. As I write in the book, you know, uh, uh, back in the day, like, you know, when I was a kid, which is not all that long ago, my dad was was a pastor in the evangelical Presbyterian church. And so we grew up evangelicals. But there was always a a very uh, common understanding that, you know, to be an evangelical that the word was only really as good as your actions. In other words, um, the label there, evangelical, in in that word was a verb, which was to evangelize, right? And so I'm not sure in the modern context that you can be an effective evangelical because many people who hear that term want nothing to do with you. And they think it has everything to do with political opportunism and political tribalism. And, you know, they think that you're basically a conser- a conservative MAGA Trumper, and uh, it really has no theological connotation beyond that. So I don't know that I am comfortable identifying with the term anymore because I, I, I fear that it does more harm than good. I see, but you actually are an evangelical from the first definition you gave me, and it sounds like you worry about it being misunderstood. Because when, as I was reading this, it's, it's very clear that you take very seriously uh, the teachings of Christ and the history of him, that you're a student of that history. The title is taken from the kingdom, the power, and the glory is from, what, what is that, from Matthew? Well, it's from, it is from the Lord's Prayer. So, and that is uh, when, when Jesus is teaching his disciples who are... Um, kind of a motley crew, uh, not not to go down the rabbit hole, but it's sort of hilarious that Jesus actually has to teach his disciples, these 12 people who are now, of course, looked back upon as the, the leaders of the early church and the saints and these guys who we revere were really kind of um, almost like kind of kind of bumbling and incoherent at times, and they really didn't know what to do. And so Jesus sort of had to teach them, okay, well, this is how you pray, among many other things that Jesus had to sort of teach them how to do. And so at the end of that prayer, the, the, the traditional doxology at the end of the prayer is to say, and for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And what does that mean? To thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. If you accept me, if you accept my teachings, then you'll have the power and the glory and the kingdom. Of, well, of heaven. I think it, I think it means a, a couple of things. Um, I talked a minute ago about this idea of uh, as a Christian removing oneself from the throne and and putting Jesus there and uh, allowing Him to be the the Lord of your life. The idea of saying of praying to God and saying for Thine the possessive Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I think the, the maybe the better way to, to even say it or hear it is to say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. In other words, there are earthly counterfeits 
for each of those things. It's what, how I try to structure the book, writing about the kingdom of God that we are promised as believers, a, a kingdom of heaven that is eternal and that cannot be defeated and that has already been secured by Jesus's work on the cross. That kingdom is there for us. And yet we have become consumed with a kingdom here on earth, a kingdom of America, a kingdom that is sort of defined by the conquering of our enemies in the culture and of, uh, of sort of dominating the world around us with our values and doing it with a sort of bloodthirsty, you know, militant way that actually betrays the teachings of Christ. That's where you're talking about the extremism, uh, the age of extremism. And you, you had written a book, American Carnage, a best-selling New York Times book before uh, this book. And basically, that was about how Trump took over the party. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the first book, it, it was sort of a, a wide lens examination of the collapse of the post-George W. Bush Republican Party and the rise of Trump and, and Trump-style populist nativist politics that came to then sort of hijack the, the old guard of the, the Republican Party. And he did it incredibly successfully. You know, it's funny, when I think of evangelicals, I think of Jimmy Carter. So that, uh, mm. that was my first blush with what's an evangelical. And Jimmy Carter was so, um, so clearly devout and so clearly lived those values, especially after he left the presidency and did all this work in Africa and all that stuff. I thought, okay, that's that's what's an evangelical. What percentage of the evangelical vote did Jimmy Carter get in his uh, seventy six race? In his seventy, I'd have to go back and look, uh, but he it was a majority. You know, suffice it to say, it was the high water mark for any Democrat in the last half century. Uh, and then because, things flipped. I mean, it completely flipped. Yeah. And that that period is interesting because Reagan obviously took. Uh, the evangelicals and people like um, Falwell were uh, creating things like the moral majority. Falwell is a very, very strong right winger and started the moral majority. What's the difference between the moral majority and the Christian coalition? It was just who ran them or what? Well, the Christian Coalition came later. It was sort of a successor group. Um, the moral majority was really the first iteration of what we now have is like an entire constellation of these kind of activist groups that sort of fundraise off of, you know, restoring our Judeo-Christian values and basically holding up Jesus as a, an avatar for the Republican Party. Like that, that is that has become kind of a cottage industry, but the moral majority was really the birth of it. And you're right. I mean, it was it was those four years between 76 and 80, the, the four years of Carter's presidency, where not only the moral majority was created and, and, and mobilized, but also this kind of entire movement around kind of merging conservative political identity with conservative theology, with conservative cultural values. I mean, this was an incredibly formative four years in the life of this country, and we're still, I think, dealing with the fallout of it. And it is really ironic, as you say, that it happened on the watch of the Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher, Jimmy Carter, who was personally more devout than almost any of these folks. I would say, I don't know if you could be more devout than Jimmy Carter. He still teaches or has taught Sunday school until he went in the hospice, I think. I'm sort of interested in that, that period, but also I want to go back to your father and your father dying of a heart attack, and you went back to your church had had you left the church then? Were you still living in Michigan or? No, I moved away. So I'd been gone for, for you know, probably 12 years or so at that point, living in Washington, uh, covering politics. But I was still going back home probably three or four times a year. And when I did, I would go to church. And, you know, my family is basically our identity as a family was uh, almost inextricable from the, sure. the church. And that was just the community that we were raised in and, and, and all of our friends and, you know, the people that we knew were there. So I still very much felt like I was a part of the church, even though I wasn't living there. So you go back 
for your dad's funeral. You had written American Carnage, which uh, I haven't read, but I assume is very critical <laughs> of, uh, of Trump and Trump supporters. And when you get there and are have arrived to see your dad, you start getting chastised. Yeah, it was, uh, I suppose, from the perspective of some people who had beef with me over the things I'd written or maybe things I'd said on, you know, on cable TV or, or wherever, they might not get another crack at me. You know, I, I don't live there and maybe they, you know, they, they don't see me all that often. And so they just couldn't help themselves in that moment. Yeah, I think the timing too, Al, like that book I'd written had just come out less than two weeks before my dad died. And so I, you know, the book was in the news. Um, a, a lot of people were talking about it, especially, you know, people in kind of right wing media circles, Rush Limbaugh and others were, were talking about it. And, and um, not and, favorably. And I, and I was uh, uh, not favorably, yeah. no, not favorably. And, and I was very critical of Trump in the book. And so, yeah, I mean, there I am at, at the, at the visitation, at the, at the wake, one person after another, just, you know, kind of took the opportunity right then and there to kind of have it out with me and, and give me a piece of their mind. And obviously it was, it was pretty upsetting, but it was also, I think it was just really eye opening at the same time to understand the depth of the problem here that, that I was kind of aware of already. I mean, I was aware of the problem and, and I think I was probably even aware of like the scale of the problem, but I think the depth and the scale are two different things. And, and the depth being demonstrated at that moment by people confronting a morning sun over politics, you know, with his dad in a box 50 feet away. Uh, your dad is beloved at the church, and one would think that the son is beloved by your father. It just seems inconceivable that this would happen. Jews can be edgy, but I don't see this, you know, uh, and you were shocked by it. Yeah, in part because of what you just said. I mean, we, you know, I, I'd been at this church since I was, um, my, my family moved there when I was five years old. And so I, you know, I'd been, spent my entire life there and my dad was beloved. And so you figure that even if they hate my guts, just out of kind of respect for him and reverence for him, that they would hold back a little bit. As I try to explain in the book, I think this is not excusing it. It's maybe just sort of trying to make sense of these sorts of behaviors that there's this doomsday mentality for an awful lot of folks in this who who are swimming in the circles that that um, I came up in where they believe that the walls are closing in and that the enemy is about to conquer them it it leads them to do things and say things and ally themselves with people you know, that they never would otherwise and this is basically becomes the second book, which is your now going to look at all these evangelical churches around the country, right? That's right. I Just trying to, again, as I said, I already knew from my pretty extensive reporting during the you know pre-Trump years, then into the Trump years, like I, I I was pretty well acquainted with the evangelical movement, and I I understood what was what was going on. What I really felt inspired, if you want to use that word, uh, it was a weird inspiration. But what I did feel inspired to do was to try and take on this question in a more intimate way. We, we, I guess, which is to say that you know, as a reporter, you're typically not kind of injecting yourself into the story. But in a, in a case like this, you know, my faith identity is my ultimate identity. It's it's certainly more important than my identity as a journalist. And so both as a journalist and as a Christian, I felt sort of an obligation to take a really hard and uncomfortable look at my own community and to try to explain to people on the outside, but maybe also to people on the inside, because I know I'm not the only one who's been left just slack jawed by all this, just explain what's going on and why. Well, let's explain it. Um, when I when I think of Falwell, you don't write very uh, kindly of, of Falwell, and you say basically he was a good businessman, but certainly not a great preacher. Do you remember what he said after nine eleven? Yeah, I do. I, I got I wrote it down. 
but I, I think I almost have it memorized. This is after 9-11. He's on the 700 Club with Pat Robertson. And he says, I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who have tried to secularize America, I point my finger in their face and say, you help this happen. And then Robertson said, I totally concur. That says a lot to me about what you must have been focused on. Yeah. Uh... A lot to unpack. Lot to unpack. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the part of the reason I'm chuckling, Al, is because, I mean, believe it or not, that, that, those were almost the good old days. Like, you know, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember that. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, there's a, there's a scene somewhere in the middle of the book where I recount how, um, at, at one of these, successor groups. Uh, I talked earlier about, you know, the Christian coalition being kind of a successor of the moral majority. So then another group that's a successor of the Christian coalition is the uh, Faith and Freedom Coalition. Mm -hmm. They get together every year and they parade, you know, a couple dozen Republican politicians to the lectern and they do the fire and brimstone thing and everybody gets all worked up and they raise some money off of it. Talk about unholy alliances. It's, um, but, but I will say, you know, I'd attended events like that for many years. They were always exaggerated and it was a lot of hyperbole. And But but there was also always sort of some like winking and nodding and uh, kind of an acknowledgement that they were in on the joke, more or less. But the last few years, it's taken this very, very serious, dark turn where it's no longer like the Democrats have policies that are hurting this country. It's the Democrats are demons and the Democratic Party is the tool of Satan. And this is no longer red versus blue. It's no longer conservative versus liberal. It is good versus evil and evil cannot be negotiated with. And I describe in detail what that looks like at some of these events in the book. But when you conjure up Falwell there post 9-11, it's funny because like at the time, of course, everyone is completely aghast at hearing him say that sort of thing. And yet today, I don't know that we even bat an eye. I mean, it's it's gotten way worse. And I think that we've become somewhat desensitized to it. So you're, you're, um, you write this book about evangelicals and before that about Trump. You're a political writer and now you're back to writing for Atlantic Monthly. What are you seeing happen? We now have, it's Trump and Biden, right? Is this evangelical base going to come out in big numbers and and where do they get their information and why do, are they convinced for example that he actually won the election or is that a silly question well no it's not a silly question i i think um where they get their information is a, that's a really important uh kind of sub category or sub genre that we could spend an entire podcast talking about but i think that there is an information subculture that a lot of folks are plugged into that um we don't appreciate and it's and it goes beyond just oh well they watch fox news at night like you know sure some it's a lot of radio isn't it uh, yeah it's their radio it's their podcasts that i mean that was one of the things again, without going deep down the rabbit hole, but I, I was really interested in my travels over a period of years when I would be encountering folks in a lot of these just kind of small, medium-sized churches around the country. And I'd say, you know, we'd be in conversation for a while. And I'd say, hey, you know, what kind of podcast do you listen to? Let me see. And they would, they'd run me through, you know, five, six podcasts that they listen to every day. And I'd never heard of them. Or, or the same would go for their, their social media pages. They subscribe to certain influencers or newsletters or blogs or whatever that were just things that I hadn't been familiar with previously. And then you come to learn that these things actually have pretty good followings and they get passed around at kind of a grassroots level. And so... That's a piece of it, I think. Certainly, is the is the information consumption, and we get ours from our our information. But we like to think of ours as being slightly more objective. Like we think that uh, Biden won the election. Yeah, well, well, to be clear, we all live in our little information subcultures, and we all want to think that ours are more accurate and more legitimate. This is one of those sort of relativist meets reality moments where the relative 
truthiness, as Colbert might have said back in the day, was uh, between what some liberal reads or some conservative reads, like, you know, you can kind of go around on that. But like when it comes to just objective truth of like, did you know, did did Donald Trump carry the state of Michigan? Yes or no. C- can you look at the, the trail of evidence that was examined by the Republicans who run the legislature in Michigan and who issued a really thorough, comprehensive report authored by Trump supporting Michigan Republican senators who say that, no, Trump did not win Michigan. Here's all the evidence and here's all the debunked conspiracies and here's all the research we did. And it is very clear Trump did not win Michigan. And yet you go into all these churches in Michigan where I am from and where I live now. You will still run into people who are not only who not only believe that Trump won Michigan, but they believe it with a sort of spiritual conviction. Mm -hmm. And I think that is obviously that's that is the bigger problem. It's not just in my view anyway, Al, and this is the view of a a Christian here. So uh, it may not be the view of you or of others listening, but I think. The problem is not just one for purposes of sustaining a pluralistic democratic society where rule of law matters and where peaceful transition of power matters and where some common shared baseline of objective truth matters. But I think it's an even bigger problem, in my view, for the credibility of the gospel of Jesus Christ when people who profess to believe in him and who swear that their theology and their doctrine is sound and true will turn around and in the next breath swear that this other thing is sound and true, one thereby sabotaging the other. I I think that there's sort of a dual crisis here within the church. You know, um, the first day of the Trump presidency, he had the inaugural, and then the next morning, Sean Spicer went out and said that Trump's crowd was bigger than either of uh, Obama's, which was demonstrably not true by a mile. And then uh, Kellyanne Conway was on Meet the Press the next day, and she said, well, you see, there are these things called alternative facts, alternative facts. And I laughed at that, but then I kind of got to realize that, well, Trump was saying there's fake news, and f- that's from liberals, and fake news is putting out fake facts, and that's why we have to have alternative facts. And it's kind of flooding the zone with shit, which is what Steve Bannon said. So there's so much out there, and you just kind of take the information from the people that you side with. And as a result, we have a complete different universe of information and knowledge held by two sides. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you can see just in communities how that fractures relationships and, and, and how it fractures, you know, church bodies. Uh, you know, it's funny. I remember having this conversation some years ago with John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, uh, I'd spent many months with him shortly after he retired, uh, writing what became sort of the definitive magazine profile where he kind of looked back on his career and how the party had changed and how Washington had changed and all of this. And I said to him at one point, I said, well, what was the biggest change You know, from the time that you came to Congress in 1990? till the time you left in 2015. So that's 25 years. What's the, what's the single biggest change in our politics or in the system or whatever? And he didn't even like hesitate. He said, well, it's the media. It's all the media. It's the information system. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, in 1990, you know, me and my neighbor who, you know, guy next door who was a Democrat and we disagreed on a lot of politics, like every morning we both got the Cincinnati Inquirer dropped off on our front lawn And we listened to some of the same radio stuff as we drove around in our cars at work, taking kids to school and whatnot. And then we came home and we watched the same 6.30 telecast. And then when we'd be outside drinking a beer at night uh, over the fence, we'd be arguing about the same stuff that we heard, but we'd be arguing from a shared baseline of facts, you know, that that we'd we'd been tuned into the same thing. And he said, by the time I'm leaving office, he said, most of my constituent calls 
during the day and he's the speaker. So he's got a whole staff of people who, you know, as you know, you, you know, you guys, senators and members of Congress, member of the House, you know, you guys have a staff who are just dedicated to answering calls. But but the speaker's got an even bigger staff. A, a lot of whom I hear say, I'm sorry to hear you say that, sir. <laughs> That's exactly. a very common <laughs> thing coming from yeah. the. They're like, they're like, they're like grief counselors, right? And Boehner is explaining, he's saying, you know, like, I've got a whole staff of the, of people who are answering phones for me all day long. And all they're hearing is just like nonsense. It's just like all this kind of right wing conspiracy stuff that's through the blogosphere and through the social media and through Fox News and talk radio. And he's saying, you know, like, they're not even calling to complain about some bill that we're pushing. They're not calling to complain about some vote that I took. They're calling to complain about something that they swear is happening that actually isn't happening. Right. And so how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, like a QAnon uh, rumor or something. Sure. Yeah. I mean, to, you know, it's, 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 it's a flavor of the month, right? It's constant, but there's, oh, you know, if it's Trump being cheated or it's the deep state or it's QAnon or it's, you know, the invasion of uh, it's, you know, migrants being legalized so that Democrats can take power. It's the great replacement theory. Right. I mean, you name it, right? We're just divided. Is that it? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, being divided, I think, is nothing new. Obviously, you know your history and it's the, the country has been divided for a long time over a lot of different things. What I try to get at in the book is when those divisions take on kind of these greater existential, spiritual, cosmic stakes where you no longer think it's just we're, we're fighting over immigration policy or we're fighting over abortion policy or we're fighting over foreign policy uh, because those are our policy differences and, and there's going to be a partisan dispute here and there's going to be a winner and a loser and then we kind of move on to the next election and then we do it all over again. There's much more now this sense on the right broadly, but I think specifically in the evangelical movement where there is a kind of a blood and soil God and country, us versus them, good versus evil mentality, as I described it earlier. What does blood and soil mean? Yeah, in that context, what, what, I, what I'm getting at is a belief that this is a holy land, that this is a, a nation that is consecrated in the eyes of God, that any of these pagan secularists who wanted to create the idea of a separation of church and state that they really have done so to try and eliminate Christianity from public life. Mm -hmm. And look how successful they've been, by the way, right? They kicked prayer out of public schools. They've indoctrinated our kids. They've, they've turned people against the church and we see membership declining because of it. Therefore, they've declared war on God in America. And, and the only response for us as Christians is to declare war on them. Do they realize that the First Amendment starts with freedom of religion? There'd be nothing to stop the formation of religion and nothing to interfere with its exercise as the First Amendment. <laughs> you know, um, let's, let's not let legal language get in the way here, Al, of, uh, of, of what we're trying to do. It's the First Amendment by, uh, of the Bill of Rights <laughs> written by our founding fathers, that should have some weight. Yeah, it should. But it's interesting. Um, I introduce readers in the book to a guy named David Barton. If people don't know who he is, they should, and they should pay more attention to what he's doing. But basically, he is the conservative movement and the evangelical movement. He is their favorite historian. And, and, and I'm putting historian in air quotes here. Um, basically, David Barton has spent the last number of years perfecting, you know, who Kellyanne Conway has her alternative facts, then David Barton has his alternative history. And central to his alternative history is this idea that no, 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 really, the founders did mean to create a Christian nation. And they sort of spoke in code at times with some of these founding texts. But really, there's no question 
that they created us to be a Christian nation and they intended Christianity to uh, kind of infuse all of our institutions and our society and our communities. And that the secularists have defeated that, that the secularists have changed the identity of this of this nation to its core. And so therefore, we are now called to reclaim it. That is, you know, when you read about or hear about the Christian nationalist movement or the Christian nationalism as kind of a new fad ideology, that is very much what we're talking about here. How, how racist is Christian nationalism? Well, it's, I, I think, inherently racist in, in, in some sense, because what you're talking about reclaiming, if you believe that the idea here is to reclaim something that's been lost, what they want to reclaim in part is the white dominant Christian culture, white dominant patriarchal throwback post-World War II. White leave it Christian to male, America, male. Yeah, where, where everybody else just sort of stayed in their lanes and, and did what they were told. I mean, that's that's obviously not even getting into some of the ugly history of racism in sort of um, mainstream American Protestantism, which we're still dealing with today, by the way. Let's talk about the Southern Baptists. Yeah. Um, when were they founded? So the Southern Baptists were founded mid 19th century, and they were founded explicitly as a splinter away from the mainline Baptists who were supportive of the abolitionist movements in the U.S. And so the Southern Baptist Convention was formed as an explicitly anti-abolitionist pro-slavery entity. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, a tough, that's a tough history to shake. There are Southern Baptists, there are black churches that are Southern Baptists, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, this is this is um, an evolution from then. Yeah, well, and this is the struggle within the Southern Baptist Convention. I think it's also the struggle within American Christianity and maybe even American life more broadly. Um, there, you know, the if you, if you believe that the original sin of this country was in fact slavery, there's something I think deeply profound and spiritual, maybe even the lowercase s spiritual about kind of understanding the way in which race and racism, racial hatred, racial demagoguery continues to fracture the nation today and continues to fracture the church today. So yeah, you have inside the Southern Baptist Convention itself, you have seen just in the last five or six years, like this massive flashpoint, kind of a reckoning over the question of race. And are we finally going to address this elephant in the room, which many of us have just sort of chosen not to for a very long time because, well, things have gotten better, haven't they? You know, we do have black congregants in our in our churches now. We do have black preachers in some of our churches now. We do have a majority black churches in the SBC. So isn't it okay now? Haven't we sort of moved past this? We elected a black president, didn't we? Do we do we really have to but then every time you have an episode like you had with the the killing of George Floyd in uh in 2020, it flares right back up. It's like this wound that just won't stay closed. And so the Southern Baptists have undergone a really painful period and are continuing in the, in the midst of this very painful period where, in fact, a lot of black congregants and black pastors have left the SBC because of kind of the backlash to the backlash, if you will, and, and an unwillingness to, to have some of the hardest conversations around race and religion and and how they commingle in in American Christianity. Now, tell me about uh Liberty University, if you will. It was started by Falwell and he was a very good businessman, right? Yeah, he was. He was a, a brilliant businessman and um kind of a master manipulator who knew what got people worked up and then knew how to take advantage of it. So, you know, Liberty University is a really fascinating story. I could have written an entire book just about Liberty. But basically, what you have to understand is that Jerry Falwell Sr. built out an empire that changed American Christianity and it changed American life. And that empire consisted of three 
parts, three cogs to the machine, if you will. The first was his mega church, which was in Lynchburg, Virginia. Thomas Road Baptist is the name of the church, and it's still there today. His his son, uh, one of his sons, uh, Jonathan Falwell, is the pastor. Right, huge church. His other son kind of blew it. <laughs> the other son, yeah, yeah. The other right, that's, junior. Well, junior. yeah. So he's got he's got two sons. He's got two sons, of course, J- Jerry Falwell Jr., who uh, became sort of uh, most known for his affiliation with Donald Trump and then kind of spectacular fall from grace uh, with a sex scandal and the pool boy and all of that. And then Jonathan Falwell, who is the pastor, who is, um, I think, kind of regarded as the um, one who um, got it right, who, who didn't stray. The mega church is one piece of it. And then, of course, the moral majority is the final piece of it that comes later, comes towards the the late 1970s. But really, the key piece in the middle of it that is underappreciated is this little college that he starts in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. It's called initially Lynchburg Baptist College and nobody's heard of it. It's got an enrollment of like 1200 kids. It's, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere and Falwell, after the school has been in business for a few years, it's not even clear that the school can stay open. They're not making any money and they have no facilities. It's, it's just kind of a pet project almost, but Falwell, he really uh, shrewdly senses that there is an appetite in the kind of uh, on the Christian right in the the, the nascent movement of sort of uh, Christian conservatives that there's an appetite in academia to sort of push back on the secularization and the liberal trends in in higher education that that are being seen around the country and that are being written about a lot at the time. Sure. And so he kind of capitalizes on that and he changes the name uh, to coincide with the bicentennial in 1976. He changes the school's name to Liberty University and he changes the colors. They were gold and green and he changes them to red, white, and blue. And they embark on this this kind of big fundraising tour around the country where they basically say that the liberals and the secularists have declared war on God in America. And we at Liberty University are going to take it back. We're going to take this country back and we're going to, we're going to restore God's place in American life, all all the rest. And, you know, you, you've, you've heard all the rhetoric, but it's impossible to overstate Al just how important and how influential this was at that moment with, again, you know, Carter is in office and people are really freaking out. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks uh, suddenly they're, they're worried, do what, you know, can we send our kids to a college where they won't be indoctrinated? Are they still going to go to church once they've left our house? Like there's this kind of moral panic setting in for portions of the, of um, the American public. And so Liberty really starts to grow and become more and more influential. And of course, now looking back, it has become, I think, the dominant Christian university, uh, both in terms of its, its size, its influence, but also in terms of its place in the sort of right wing ecosystem. It is a, it is a, a massively important force, both at a political and, and at a cultural level. Uh, where does it relate to like Bob Jones University? I remember when my son was applying to college, I was very curious about Bob Jones because they didn't let male students date female students or obviously male students date male students. There was no touching. (laughs) There was, my son was applying to college. So I, I had him like make inquiries into Bob Jones because I wanted to hear what they said. And I kind of did without my son's permission. And one day he got a call from a a co-ed at at Bob Jones who wanted to know where he went to church in New York. And my son said, Dad, don't do this. And I ended up, when I was writing Lies and Lying Liars, who tell them a fair balance look at the right, I brought a student who looked young enough from, from Harvard and we went there for the day, and everybody was very nice, I must say. Uh, but that we were kind of somebody recognized me, and we were found out. So we had to kind of run away. But I noticed they had <laughs> they had uh, they had all this uh, art, this all this uh, Renaissance, all, all this art of of uh, sacred art. And I thought, oh man, 
Bob Jones, whatever, the second or something, had gotten this art in Germany in the 30s. And I felt like, oh, man, this is really evil. <laughs> and I, uh, where, where is, is Bob Jones? That's an evangelical school, right? Yeah, Bob Jones was sort of, during that era especially, probably be, even better understood as kind of a fundamentalist school. What's the difference between fundamentalism and evangelicalism? That's a great question. I mean, basically, the, without, without putting you to sleep here, Falwell himself had come from the fundamentalist tradition, and, and fundamentalists really believed for a long time, I suppose some probably still do, although uh, these folks would be dying off at this point, but really believed, and Falwell used to preach that like their kingdom is not in this world, and therefore they should be almost separatists from this world. So Falwell, early in his career, would preach against any sort of civic involvement, civic engagement. He used to denounce other preachers who were getting involved with like the civil rights uh, movement, not, not on ideological grounds per se, and not explicitly, but just basically saying, that's not our job as pastors. Our, he had this famous line where he said, you know, pastors are called to be soul winners, not, you know, political movers and shakers, basically. Ironic, ironic. Yes, quite ironic because of the, the arc that he would then follow. But that the fundamentalism, among other things, really was very strict in its applications around like, no, you, you don't you don't have any business sullying your Christian identity with the sort of nasty, sordid political stuff. So very different from the evangelicals that you profile. That's right. Well, and, and, you know, by the way, like there's almost something, you know, now knowing what we know now, there's almost something refreshing about that fundamentalist doctrine where, where you're just almost going to err on the side of not engaging with this stuff at all because it's, you know, could so defile your soul. Like, obviously it's an extreme, it's an extreme proposition, but there's something almost, almost curiously appealing about it for someone like me who's sort of seen up close the you know what, what the other side of it looks like but you know bob jones was in many ways just circling back to kind of put a bow on the conversation around uh, race and kind of the culture wars and the rise of the moral majority during that time bob jones was a flashpoint because they would not allow uh, black students uh, in in the uh, mid 1970s, um, or I think at, uh, up until the mid 1970s, if you recall, there was a real intense public debate around the IRS. Uh, oh, that's right, threatening yep. mm -hmm. Bob Jones and some other Christian uh, universities, smaller Christian universities who were receiving federal funds or who had students who were getting federal loans and basically threatening to shut it down because they were practicing race based discrimination. And Falwell Sr. and some of his allies were very opportunistic in kind of pouncing on that and saying, you see, here's the government weaponizing to, you know, come after Christianity. Here's, here's the government, here's the secular government coming after Christians, persecuting Christians in America for our beliefs. When I think anybody who was honest would, was looking at that and saying, well, that's not, there's no uh, secular plot. That's the government saying you can't segregate your schools and that we won't. Exactly. Right. There, there's, a, there's a difference here. And yet that's the sort of thing that once that narrative got into the bloodstream, there was no getting it out. And they were very effective at getting it into the bloodstream. So what do you want your readers to draw from this in terms of where we are and where we're going? How, how do uh, one just to be aware of it, but how, how do we address these people? And is, is it hopeless? I mean, in terms of they're just not listening to our stuff. They're not reading our stuff. They're not watching our stuff. No, I don't think it's hopeless. And, you know, when we talk about these people, I mean, even if you're thinking about like some of the hardcore folks who, to be clear, as I state on like the second or third page of the book, there's there's a real vast spectrum here in terms of 
who these folks are and, and, and their behaviors and their attitudes and why they do the things they do. And, and I'm not out to caricature or stereotype any of them. I, I, I want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. But I think even when we're dealing with the folks who you might want to caricature, the really extreme set of folks, I think the best remedy to all of this, and by the way, it's the same thing that I would preach to the evangelical the, who is trying to come up with answers to, okay, well, how do I engage my liberal neighbor who, who believes uh, in none of the stuff that I believe in, socially, culturally, theologically, how, how am I supposed to engage with them? I'd say the exact same thing, which is like, you know, a little bit of love and a little bit of goodwill goes a long way. And if that sounds, yep. you know, phone, phony or, or corny, I don't particularly care. Uh, I've been <laughs> in some, I've had some amazing conversations in the last couple of months uh, out, you know, on tour promoting this book. I've been in settings with people who have almost nothing in common at all uh, in terms of their biography and their beliefs and all of it. And yet uh, they share a common love for this country and for their community and a willingness to perhaps set aside some of those things that do divide them and focus on sort of the bigger picture. And that is, um, you know, can we as Americans, can, as neighbors, can we hold on to this thing that we've inherited? Can we survive? Can we? Can this experiment endure? And if so, what is required of us to do that? And And I think there is still hope for that, at least in my view. But, but uh, you know, there, there has to be a recognition of the dangers that exist. And one of the dangers is, does exist at this kind of intersection of hard right, MAGA, kind of militant politics and the religious justification drawn from misreadings of scripture and bad theology and bad history and how that can create this kind of toxic brew that we've seen here that I'm writing about in the book. But I would just want to be clear, Al, like as a, as a, as a Christian, as someone who believes that God is sovereign over, over all of this and that, as my dad used to say from the pulpit, that God does not bite his fingernails. He never has and he never will. He's not nervous. He's not nervous over this. And, and I'm not I can't, I can't be nervous either if, if I'm, if I'm being faithful. And so my job is to be faithful and it's to try and influence people around me to, to take their eyes off of the petty partisan disputes of the day and and put their eyes back towards Jesus. And once they do that, once they're reminded of what, uh, of the, of the central teachings of loving your neighbor and of loving your enemy and of praying for those who persecute you and turning the other cheek and and trying to embrace those around us and show them what the love of Jesus really means like that that's going to go a long way just in my own community towards solving these problems well i i hope you enjoyed uh listening that beautiful music is by leo kotke the great leo kotke i want to thank peter ogburn for producing this podcast We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.